welcome to chapter story time where we are going to be reading the second half of chapter 16 and chapter 17 of the wizard in my shed by simon farnaby illustrated by claire powell and read with the kind permission of harder publishers and last time murden and all of the children were in the woods where murden is trying to find some ingredients to make potions and spells to help him try and defeat the person who he thinks is jerobo and we've also now picked up tamsin who turns out to be shakia's sister even though she is one of rose's arch enemies the cats and um, when we left them, Murden had got fed up with them all being obsessed with their smartphones and dumped them in a pond. So they were all soaking wet, but they were all just messing around and having a good time. So let's pick up where we left off in chapter 16, which is called With Friends Like These Who Needs Anemones. While Rose and her sort of friends were cavorting in the water, Murden stocked up his supplies for his battle with Jerobo the next day. He needed to get hold of Jerobo's spell book if he was going to get home. It was the only way he knew to access the River of Time. Jerobo wouldn't just hand it over, however, so Murden collected ingredients for a special spell of his own, a disenchantment potion. This was a liquid which, once drunk, would render a W blood powerless forever. One drop and nabbing the spell book from Jerobo would be as easy as taking eggs from a bird's nest. This was seen as okay in the Dark Ages, but it's now frowned upon, so don't try this at home. Murden then collected wood and set it ablaze with a fire spell. Whoosh, crackle. Rose was the first to climb out of the pool and huddle by the fire to drive off, dry off, and Tamsin followed. What else can you do? Tamsin asked Murden as she took off her hoodie and spread it out beside her to dry faster. Can you make fireballs and stuff? And can you make lightning come from your fingers like in Star Wars? Wanted Chris, joining them with Shakya. Murdin hadn't a clue what Chris was talking about. Come see me practice for my battle in the morning, he said. I'll show you fireballs and lightning, the likes of which the world has never seen. But you teach me how to do fireballs, asked Chris in excitement. Only W Bloods can do real magic, said Rose, rolling her eyes. Isn't that right, Murdin? That is right, he agreed. Are your father or mother a warlock, wizard or witch? Well, Rose can be a bit of a witch sometimes, said Chris. Rose elbowed him in the ribs for his cheek. Ow! Maybe we should show them something, eh, hey, Rose? Murden put out a hand. Give me bubbles. Rose passed a dry but still cross bubbles over. I'll bet everyone a bag of hay that this won't end well, said Bubbles. Oh, it's poo time. Yeah, here it comes. Hang on. Oh, not a poo, a wee. False alarm. Tamsin and Rose clapped their hands over their mouths to hide their giggles as Bubbles did a wee in Murden's lap. Bah, thou filthy animal, cried Murden. Thou did ask us for it. He banged his staff on the ground and threw crushed nettle leaves into the air around the guinea pig. And in a foxy loxy, he intoned. And with that, Bubbles turned into a fox. Pop! The laughter halted as everyone gasped in delight. Oh, crikey, said Bubbles the fox. What's going on here? That's not my nose. Hang on. Bubbles looked at his fluffy red tail. That's not my tail. Have I been eaten by a fox? Rose couldn't help it. Despite Bubbles' alarm, another snort of laughter escaped from her nose. Tamsin and her sister were clutching onto each other, tears of glee rolling down their cheeks. Even Chris had given into a cool smirk. Animabophonium totemode. Murden banged his staff on the ground again, pop, and this time Bubbles turned into a toad. Oh, what now, croaked Bubbles the toad. What's wrong with me voice? I feel cold, so cold. Why are you looking at me? He instinctively flicked out his tongue and caught a fly on it before whipping it back into his mouth and gulping hard. Oh, I feel sick. Why did I just do that? I don't eat flies. That's disgusting. Stop, cried Tamsin, laughing so much she was hardly able to breathe. Please stop. Murdin turned Bubbles back into himself. Rose, her brother, Tamsin and Shakia were all rolling around in fits of giggles by now. That's better, said Bubbles, relieved. I didn't feel myself then for a minute. You know when you don't feel yourself? I didn't feel myself then. And he saw everyone thumping the grounds with their fists. They were laughing so hard. Shut up, all of you which only made them laugh even more. Even Murden joined in, chuckling with mirth as the sun went down. <laughs> Why does everyone laugh at me? said Bubbles to himself. I am literally the least funny person I know. Who'd have thought it? Bubbles the guinea pig. Some would pay to watch his comedy gig. And now on to chapter 17, which is called Potions and Commotions. 
As it was, on the way, Shakia dropped Tamsin off at their house before driving the others home. Rose waved goodbye, but Tamsin walked through the front door without waving back. Maybe she's just tired, Rose whispered to Bubbles. Bubbles gave her a cynical look. No mean feat for a guinea pig. It was nearly 10.30 by the time Shakia pulled into Daffodil Close. She'd driven as slowly as she possibly could so that Murden didn't feel sick. To pass the time, the warlock was trying to teach them the rap, 6th century folk song, which he delivered with such success in the shopping centre. And the gum tree hush will get by bush in a mush. The white willow log will have thee up with a buck. Nay, 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 complained Murdered. Tis the gum tree bush will get thy mush in a hush. And there's no such thing as a willow log. It doesn't make sense your way. The jollity in the car was brought to an abrupt halt, however, for as they approached Rose and Chris's house, they saw not one but three police cars parked outside. Rose's mum, Sergeant Murray and several officers were waiting, all looking very cross indeed. Uh-oh, said Rose, although she was also a little pleased to see her mum off the sofa again, even if it was to give them a telling off. I could blast them with a fireball, Murden offered. No, came the collective response. As far as we, as far as they know, we've done nothing wrong, really. They can't possibly believe Murden did all that with magic powers," said Rose. They said on the news it was a stink hole, right? Chris agreed. Rose and Shakir looked at each other and decided not to correct him. So we've nothing to fear," said Rose sensibly. "We best just face the music." They stepped out of the car to face said music, or Sergeant Murray's loud hailer, to be precise. Put the staff down! Sergeant Murray roared at Murden through his loud hailer, which was totally unnecessary as he couldn't have been more than four metres away. The policeman realised this and uh, put it away. Why didn't you answer my phone calls and messages? demands the furious Susie. I missed the making of Britain's Got Talented People thanks to you. And as for you, Uncle Martin... She turned on the warlock, who'd almost forgotten who he was supposed to be. I'm very disappointed in you. And what on earth are you wearing? Murden was still dressed in his MC warlock trendy togs. The whole lot of you are under arrest, announced Sergeant Murray next. What exactly did we do wrong, asked Rose. Sergeant Murray laughed. Ha <laughs> ha, what did you do wrong? What did you do wrong? How about breaking and entering a synthetic horticultural enclosure? Vandalism of an ancient monument? Resisting arrest? Pretending to fly? And the popular hair salon Hell's Bells has reported half a very expensive tub of air cream missing. You might know something about that too. He di directed this last remark at Chris. Officers, arrest these criminals. The officers moved to put handcuffs on the four felons when Murden issued a short plea. If I am to spend the night incarcerated, he said, my, uh, may I at least change into my normal attire? These youthful garments do not befit a man of my age. Sergeant Murray looked him up and down. You got something right, at least, he said. Go on then, be quick about it. And I've got Bubbles with me, said Rose. You wouldn't put a guinea pig in prison, would you? Bubbles popped his head out of Rose's bag. What are you on about? He said in his tiny voice. You keep me in a cage. Rose quickly shushed him. And I need an overnight bag, Chris said. I'm on medication. He meant he wanted to pick up his face cream. Blimey, O'Reilly, all right, go hurry up, bellowed Sergeant Murray Tutton. <clears throat> I think you come inside a moment, Sergeant. I'll put the kettle on off of them with a sigh. It's been a long night. I think you, dear reader, would probably agree, but there was more drama to come. As you may have guessed, Murden wanted to do more than just change his clothes. Once he'd switched back into his warlock outfit, he beckoned Rose to join him in the garden where he unveiled his plan. I will take all responsibility for these crimes, he insisted. I'll say I did put the spell on you younglings and did force a thee to help me. Murden, we can't let you do that, Rose said, more than a little surprised and touched by this gesture from the usually cranky warlock. All will be fine. Now I have Thundari and I shall escape from prison without difficulty. And then what, spend your life on the run? I won't need to, Murden said in a soothing voice. Tomorrow night I shall defeat Jerobo and go home. But Rose, thou must come with me to the theatre. I must give thee the singing spell before I go. I'd love to, Murden said Rose, but I checked out tickets today. They're 50 pounds each. Then thou must buy the whole theatre. Murden dipped into his pouch and threw a handful of dirty stones at Rose and she sighed. How many times? This isn't money. With Murden and Rose arguing outside, let us concentrate for a moment on Chris. Murden had snuck him the promised love potion in the car on the way home, and with his mum making tea in the kitchen, this was Chris's chance to use it. Susie now handed cups of tea to the supporting police officers and nodded to Chris to pour the rest. Those two are for Sergeant Murray and your friend Shakia. 
she said, pointing at the red mugs near the kettle. Four and a half sugars for me, Sergeant Murray said. Chris put four and a half sugars in the sergeant's tea and half a sugar in Shakia's. He knew that she took half a sugar from the countless cups of tea he'd made her at work. Then he reached into his pocket and pulled out the little bottle that Murden had given him, trying to remember the warlock's strict instructions. Just one drop, Murden had said, and be careful that you're the first person she sees after she drinks it. Shakia was busy drying her phone on a radiator on the other side of the kitchen. This was his chance. Chris opened the potion bottle and tipped it towards the mug, but instead of just one drop, the entire bottle emptied into the mug in one go. <gasps> Sugar, Chris said. As bad luck would have it, Sergeant Murray swept in behind him at that precise moment and snatched up one of the mugs. Yeah, four and a half. This mine, he said. Chris looked at the red mug still sitting on the side. Now in a total panic, he couldn't remember which one had four and a half sugars in it and which one contained a full bottle of love potion. This must be mine then, said Shakia, and she picked up the remaining mug and sipped from it. Chris made sure he stood right in front of her as she did so, just in case. Oh, she said, making a face. How many sugars are in there? Chris started to sweat. Had he given her the wrong mug? Because in that case, Sergeant Murray took a long slurp of his tea. Oh, he said, I need more sugar in my... And his sentence trailed off, for at that moment, his eyes had fallen upon Rose and Chris's mum. Now, I don't know whether you have ever had the fortune or misfortune, some would say, to fall in love. But as soon as Sergeant Murray looked at Susie, everything went into slow motion, or it seemed that way anyway. Soft rock played in his head as she handed the tea out to the other officers. I want to know what love is. If you'd looked into his eyes at that moment, you would have seen a firework display in the shape of pink love hearts going off in each iris. Up until this point in his life, Sergeant Murray had been married to the police force. Now, for the first time ever, he was completely in love with another human. Is there a problem with the tea, Sergeant Murray, Mum asked, noticing the change in his face. You look a little sick. Which, of course, he was. Love sick. Not at all, Mrs Falvey, Sergeant Murray replied bruisily. Please call me Susie. Susie. <gasps> He savoured each syllable of her wonderful name. Did I mention how utterly beautiful you look tonight? Susie blushed. Not beautiful, she said. Well, a long time ago, maybe. The other officers were chatting about football or some such, so it was only Chris that noticed this abrupt change in Sergeant Murray, and he gulped. Hey, said Shakia, snapping her fingers in front of Chris's eyes. When this is over, do you want to go to the cinema or something? Now Chris was confused. Wait, he thought. Did she take the mug with the potion after all? Or... And this was his preferred option. Did she like him without any hocus pocus? To make matters more confusing, Murden and Rose now spilled through the back door. I should be arrested, Rose shouted. No one else. Set Rose free and arrest me, Murden insisted. Such was the hullabaloo that Sergeant Murray employed his loud hailer once again. Quiet! No one here is getting arrested, he said, much to everyone's amazement. Except maybe this lady, he added, smiling coyly at Mum, for making a criminally good cup of tea. Three cheers for our host team. The supporting police officers obediently got to their feet and cheered. Hey! We'll get out of your hair now, Susie, Sergeant Murray said mistily. Sorry to have troubled you and uh, you, Uncle Martin, and of course your wonderful children. Rose looked at Chris. What happened here? said her eyes. Chris held his hands up innocently. No idea. Though he had a fair clue, as did Murden, who'd spotted the empty love potion bottle on the side. But neither of them felt the need to say anything, especially as the mishap had literally just got them out of jail. On the way out, Sergeant Murray turned hopefully to Susie. Will you go out with me tomorrow night? Susie was so taken aback she didn't know what to say. Um, Mum's busy, said Rose, coming to her rescue. We're going to see the magician who won Britain's most talented people. Susie looked surprised, but Sergeant Murray's face lit up. Jerobo the Great in London, he said. What a good idea. We can all go. I'll get his VIP trickets. My treat. Thanks, boss, said a dozy looking officer. Not you, cretin, snapped Sergeant Murray, reverting to type. I shall pick you up at five sharp, beautiful lady, he continued, turning back to Rose's mum with a woozy smile. All of us, asked Chris hopefully. Yeah, said Sergeant Murray. You, your friend here, Rose, maybe even your little guinea pig, he laughed. From upstairs, Rose heard a faint voice. I'm fine, thanks. Don't really like magicians. Pardon? Sergeant Murray asked. That'd be great, thank you, Sergeant Murray, said Rose quickly. Please, said Sergeant Murray. Call me Leslie. And he kissed Susie's hand, said, adieu, and skipped merrily away. Wow, that was lucky, remarked Chris. We were let off and got tickets to the theatre.
Too right, agreed Rose. That's why you call two birds with one stone. Which coincidentally, said, coincidentally, said Murden, is my favourite type of soup. Rose was elated at the end of this day. Finally, her singing spell was just one night away. I'll see you next time for chapter 18, which is called Filthy Liars and Town Criers. Will they make it to London? Will they find Jarbo? <gasps> it's an exciting time. Bye-bye, everyone.